Hi guys, welcome to our next lesson. In this lesson, we're going to be learning about the battle for the American West. So what we're really going to do is we're going to take a look at the clash that's going to happen in the 19th century, in the 1800s, between Native Americans and white settlers, um, predominantly in the Great Plains and the middle of the United States. So we'll, you'll see that there are uh, Americans who are gradually moving westward, as far west as California, and they're going to come into conflict with Native Americans. And we're going to look at uh, these settlers, their lifestyle, their experiences as they settled the Great Plains. So let's get started. So let's talk about the Native, the Native Americans who lived in this region, this vast region known as the Great Plains. So first of all, when we're talking about the Great Plains, we're talking about the portion of North America that's between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. And it's uh, millions of acres today. Um, it's about a little more than uh, a dozen states that make up this land. Or, and this was, uh, or half a dozen states. And this was occupied by dozens of tribes. There, were, there wasn't just one tribe or group that settled in this uh, region but in fact, dozens of them. And some of them farmed like the Osage in Iowa, and some of them were nomadic and moved around and they followed animals and hunted. And um, these were the Sioux and the Cheyenne. Uh, and they were two of the most well known and were uh, most important tribes in the Great Plains. And um, horses were a central part of their livestock. Horses were introduced to North America and to Native Americans by the Spanish in 1598. And horses, the introduction of horses made the tribes more mobile. They could move more quickly and it made them more effective hunters and warriors as they hunted buffalo and deer. And it helped them to be able to move around the Great Plains. And speaking of buffalo, uh, buffalo was the key animal, the most important animal by far for the Native Americans and for the, especially the nomadic tribes because buffalo could provide food they could provide shelter clothing tools all of this just from one animal so buffalo was tremendously important and um this is an image this is uh, a map and it shows the area in red is the area that's the great plains um, so you can see it's about half a dozen states texas oklahoma nebraska Wyoming, the Dakotas, uh, Colorado. Um, it's a pretty large area. And um, here's an image of an American Indian on horseback hunting the buffalo. You'll notice how the Native American, he's able to keep up with the buffalo using the horse. And they were very skilled riders. Some of these tribes uh, had very skilled riders and could keep up um, with the buffalo not even holding on to the horse with their hands, just with their legs while they shoot the bow and arrow into the buffalo. And there were many scenes like this when tribes went hunting uh, buffalo. So it looked pretty similar to what you see here. So what effects did migration, particularly uh, the migration of white Americans and black Americans moving west have on American Indians? So the white settlers were moving there mainly for farmland for mining opportunities. And they argued that the natives who lived in the Great Plains, uh, who lived there, were not improving the land. So therefore, those Native Americans did not own the land. And the white settlers could, according to them, this logic, they could just take it from them. And the natives, they argued, wait, no, no, land cannot be owned. This was not, uh, this was a, a concept of owning land that wasn't something that the Native Americans believed in. They, they just didn't. And so they thought land was something that needed to be shared, but it couldn't be owned by just one person or by just a few people. And a th another important thing is the railroads came along and railroads were connecting the East and West and led to even more people, particularly white settlers, moving out of cities and moving into the Great Plains and um, uh, another important thing was the, the United States government would sign treaties with the Na American Indians for land and the U.S. government would just violate these treaties. They were they just tear them up, throw them out the window and ignore them and make different agreements with other tribes. So 
you know, because of these things happening, uh, the Native Americans rightly claim that they were being mistreated, that these treaties were violating, uh, being violated time and time again. And basically what happens is um, the U.S. government forces these tribes onto reservations throughout the Great Plains in the Western United States. And um, many of these reservations still exist today, and a lot of American Indians still live on them. And what's even worse is the U.S. government allowed for massacres to take place, and sometimes ordered massacres and attacks on American Indians. Um, and one of the worst ones was a massacre at Sand Creek in Colorado, where you had U.S. soldiers, um, a Colorado militia, who killed over 150 Arapaho and Cheyenne, uh, Indians, uh, Native Americans, and most of them were peaceful, older men and women and children. And what had happened was they had been um, they had been put onto a reservation, right, and in Colorado, and it was an unprovoked attack upon them. And um, then they had treaties like the Treaty Fort Fort Laramie, which was signed in 1868, which forced um, the Sioux of one of the largest and most organized tribes onto a reservation. But most of the tribal leaders didn't actually sign this treaty, yet they were forced to comply with it. And if they didn't comply, they were chased down by the American army. And here is uh, a map. It, it shows the expansive, uh, the expanse of the railroads, right? And... Um, you'll notice how much expansion had taken place with the railroad. Uh, look at the railroads, those in purple that were built between 1850 and 1860, right? They're, so they're building railroads at a very fast rate. And a lot of people were riding those trains to head out west for a new life. And this map right here shows uh, where the Treaty of Fort Laramie established the Great Sioux Reservation, which is today in North and South Dakota. It's in those states. And this is Sitting Bull. He was one of the most well-known and most respected leaders of the Sioux tribe. So um, Native Americans were not happy with the way they were being treated by the U.S. government. And this leads to war on the Great Plains as more and more settlers were coming out to and creating conflict with the Native Americans because they had discovered gold and silver in the Black Hills, in the Dakotas, and the Black Hills, this was sacred land to the Sioux, and they didn't like having those settlers, these white settlers, moving on to this land. Um, the Kiowa, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, Comanche, and Sioux, they protested uh, what was happening to the U.S. government. But to no avail, the U.S. government basically wasn't going to do anything about it. And this led to battles, uh, violent battles between the tribes and U.S. cavalry. And there was one conflict known as the Red River War, and it lasted for one year between the Kiowa and Comanche against the U.S. And then you had the Battle of Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand, where a group of Sioux led by the uh, chiefs like Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, and they wiped out, the Native Americans wiped out the U.S. 7th Cavalry that was led by this very flashy colonel, former general, from the Civil War named George Armstrong Custer. And um, while many Native Americans could celebrate this victory, it was very short-lived because the Sioux were quickly crushed by the U.S. military after this battle. And in fact, Sitting Bull fled to Canada and finally surrendered in 1881. And here is a painting that is a mythical portrayal of um, Custer's last stand, the Battle of Little Bighorn with Custer in the middle, you can see with his two pistols. Um, and this is an illustration made by a Native American who was actually there at the battle. And this is uh, therefore a primary source, right? This is a more historically accurate version of the battle. And here is a picture. This is um, Crazy Horse, who was one of the most respected and feared leaders of the Sioux, uh, who was at the Battle of Little Bighorn. So how did um, Native Americans adjust to this life? Because they still lived 
and a lot of this land. They lived on these reservations. How did this change their life? Well, it led to something known as assimilation. And assimilation meant that they were supposed to conform to life, to live like what uh, white Americans and lose their own Native American heritage. And there were many Americans who protested this treatment of Native Americans who actually supported American Indians in their complaints against the government. And one example was a woman named Helen, Helen Hunt Jackson, who published a book called A Century of Dishonor. And it basically exposed the numerous violations of treaties that the U.S. government had committed and all the other mistreatment by the U.S. government towards American Indians. However, many Americans supported assimilation. This is the idea that the natives give up their way of life and adapt the lifestyles of white America and basically just live like white Americans and like convert to Christianity and things like that. And this assimilation was enforced by something called the Dawes Act, known as the Dawes Act. And it was passed in 1887. And this divided the reservation that the Native Americans had been forced to move on to uh, by the American government. And it divided it between Native Americans and their families. And any land that was remaining was sold to white settlers. And two thirds of the land sadly ended up being bought by whites. So you can see, again, the Native Americans being discriminated against. And this is um, Helen Hunt Jackson, the woman who wrote A Century of Dishonor and worked really hard to try and raise awareness of the plight of Native Americans. And here's a poster. You can see where um, uh, the Dawes Act came after the Dawes Act was passed, you can see people have an opportunity to buy land for cheap. Well, that land is supposed to be for Native Americans, but instead, white settlers are selling it and making money and using it for their own purposes. So, um, and here is an image that kind of gives you a better idea about assimilation, uh, what it means. So on the left, you have a Native American in his like more cultural clothing and gear and it's more traditional clothing and then on the right he's assimilated he's looking more like a white american you'll notice that the photographer even lightened uh, his skin a little bit in the photo uh, look how dark he is in the left and how light he is on the right of the photo and one of the worst things to happen to american indians was the almost near extinction of buffalo on the Great Plains. So in 1800, you had about 65 million buffalo roaming great, the Great Plains. Then by 1890, you had fewer than a thousand left. They had nearly gone extinct due to several things. Uh, mainly over hunting was the reason. They were hunted by tourists. They were hunted by fur traders. Um, and the US Army even supported hunting buffalo in order to hurt Native Americans and to uh, take away their food supply and make them weaker. And the worst thing was these hunters would shoot the buffalo and then take the skins back to the sell them on the east coast or west coast and they'd just leave the rest of the body there to rot. Whereas the Native Americans would have used the entire buffalo to help them survive um, and would have they wouldn't have wasted the buffalo um, as a resource. And here's an image that shows buffalo skins just gathered up waiting to be shipped west. And here is an image of the, this is a skulls, buffalo skulls. So just look at the numbers. Look at um, how many of them were killed. It's, um, it's pretty sad. Thankfully today, um, we after some laws protecting them have been passed, their numbers have increased greatly, which is a good thing. Um, but unfortunately, because of all this uh, killing, the overhunting, it led to, like I said, almost the extinction of the entire species. So what's considered the, the last battle between the US military, the US government and Native Americans is something called Wounded Knee. And this really was just a massacre, not necessarily a battle but um, it's called that for, uh, battle. So 
This really was the end of any organized resistance, if you even want to call it resistance, against the U.S. government by Native Americans. And it basically started over something known as the Ghost Dance. And this was a movement that spread among the Sioux Nation as they lived on the reservations. And it was this belief that performing a specific ritual and a specific dance would lead to the disappearance of whites and would lead to the return of the buffalo and return of the land to the natives. However, this fear, fear of this movement um, led to the death of Sitting Bull by Native American police. So remember, Sitting Bull was a chief and he was killed by Native American police in 1890 because they thought he was a leader of this movement, this ghost dance movement, when he really wasn't. And so he ended up being shot by his own people. And when they were attempting to arrest him, um, many Sioux were rounded up and taken to this camp, this reservation at Wounded Knee Creek in South Dakota. And so in December of 1890, there was a standoff between the U.S. 7th Cavalry, which was Custer's old regiment, remember, from the Battle of Little Bighorn. And some of the Sioux, um, the the... U.S. soldiers were worried that they were uh, going to cause some kind of a riot, that something was going to happen. So they went around trying to collect the guns from the Sioux. And one of the guns ended up going off. It fired off. And the U.S. cavalry opened fire. And within just minutes, 300 mostly unarmed Sioux were killed, while just a handful of American soldiers were killed. And this is considered the end of what's known as the Indian Wars. Um, even though this wasn't really even a battle, it was just a very tragic massacre. So here is an image, an idea of what the ghost dance, dance might have looked like. And here's some photographs from Wounded Knee. These are photographs, they're not drawings. These are actual photographs. Uh, some of the people who were killed and it was so cold that they had to leave the bodies. They weren't actually able to bury the bodies for several days. And so the bodies of those Native Americans who were killed just were set outside and froze and were stiff. And here's another scene at, after Wounded Knee. Um, the bodies were just laid out in this open field that had been killed by American cavalry. So turning from the conflict between American Indians and settlers, let's take a look at life for these settlers. What did it look like? Because many of the settlers who moved out west, they faced a very different lifestyle than what they were used to in the west coast or west, uh, east coast and in the cities. So in the Great Plains, they, ha they had a very difficult lifestyle. And because it was so difficult, the U.S. government actively pa uh, passed laws to try to encourage the settlement of the western territories. They wanted Americans to move west between 1815 uh, and 1871. So they granted over 170 million acres to railroad companies um, to uh, try and encourage and make it easier for people to move west and encourage businesses to move west, encourage farmers to move west. And with the Homestead Act in 1862, the government offered 160 acres uh, free uh, to any settlers who wanted it. And they had over 600,000 who took the offer and they headed out west. And this included exodusters. And exodusters were, it's a term used to describe African Americans, mostly from the south, so a lot of former slaves, who left the post-Reconstruction South and headed for Kansas because they saw um, more opportunity for themselves and an escape from discrimination and Jim Crow laws if they moved out west. So a lot of them moved there and other acts followed to try and encourage folks to move west, um, including the Morrill Act of 1862 and the Hatch Act in, 18, in 1890. And these helped to, or 1887, and these helped to develop schools and other resources out there to study and improve agriculture including colleges. So a lot of universities like Ohio State University, for example, were uh, founded thanks in part to these acts. 
And then um, in 1889, Oklahoma, which had originally been territory just for American Indians, was open to settlers. And, um, you know, Native Americans had initially been forced there to the Oklahoma Territory after the Indian Removal Act, after the Trail of Tears, which we talked about. And now, after that, they had been forced to move elsewhere. So they were moved to the Oklahoma Territory, and then now that territory was being, again, taken from them. And they were forced onto reservations, forced to move into other territories. And um, it, basically, two million acres of Oklahoma Territory was claimed by settlers, by white and black settlers, in one day. And some of the settlers who snuck in early to try and get an advantage, uh, they were called Sooners, hence uh, you have the University of Oklahoma, their mascot is known as the Sooners. Um, so basically what happened was they had, like I said, just one day uh, set up where um, all these settlers could rush and try to uh, put a stake in the ground and claim that territory is theirs. And some people cheated and got there early and snuck onto the land and they were called Sooners. And then um, in 1890, we have, just like I, we, I told you about the U.S. Census. The U.S. Census takes place every 10 years. We're actually doing a census this year in 2020. So remember, remind your family to fill out the census so uh, it lets us know the different demographics of the country, right? And so in 1890, a survey, the U.S. Census was taken, and it declared that the frontier no longer existed. The United States now controlled all the territory between the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So the U.S. now was uh, one continuous land, right? A continuous land claimed all of this land and none of the territory was controlled by anybody else. And it was a momentous occasion for some folks, right? And for others, it was very tragic for the Native Americans. So here's an example of a certificate somebody would have gotten if they had gotten land from the federal government under the Homestead Act. And here is a group of settlers, what they would have looked like with their wagon and their horses and their goods as they're heading out west. So what was life like for folks out there? Uh, there are plenty of hardships. Uh, they were dealing with droughts, floods, fires, blizzards, locusts, loneliness, outlaws, robbers, and of course, they had conflicts with Native Americans. Yet by 1900, 30% of the U.S. population lived west of the Mississippi River. And uh, these settlers lived in these structures called dugouts or soddies. And they were made out of earth, out of dirt, right? Clay. Because uh, there just wasn't enough trees out there to build cabins, traditional cabins. Um, farm work increased uh, during uh, for these uh, these settlers out west, and it was supported by new technology. Things like the steel plow and mechanical reaper and barbed wire helped these farmers and ranchers increase production. Um, now, farmers they they did struggle with debt because they had to take out loans to purchase land and to buy this equipment. And um, weather also was an important factor out there in the West. It could really hurt production and made it more difficult to pay off the debt that they had incurred for buying those, that technology, those tools. And railroads also, they really didn't treat farmers well. They charged them really high rates to ship produce to the East and West Coast. So... Those were just some of the challenges. Here's an example of a dugout. Notice how uh, this house is, it's really built into the side of like a small hill and it's literally built into the dirt. Um, you can even see there's a couple horses and a, and a carriage on um, a wagon up on top of the cabin here. And here's an example of some exodusters. They were some folks who may have headed out west to escape the south and build their own cabin. And you also had uh, cowboys out there. And America really owes a debt to Mexico. The original cowboys or vaqueros were actually, they actually came from Mexico. Uh, 
and taught American cowboys a lot about ranching and how to handle animals. So these cattle ranches soon expanded all across the Great Plains. In the Southwest, uh, Texas Longhorns were valued for their beef and the demand for beef increased after the Civil War. And so they needed to get these cattle to the East Coast and West Coast and to the railroads. So cattle trails such as the um, Chisholm Trail, Chisholm Trail was established, which was uh, established in the 1850s and 60s. And this trail, it led the cattle from Texas to railroads up in Kansas, Missouri, and Colorado, where they could then go to the east and west coast. And uh, the average cattle drive would last about three months. And of course, this was difficult too because of bad weather and barbed wire and the extension of railroads. And this basically just meant um, um, with the extension of railroads, it basically meant that you didn't need cattle drives anymore. So uh, it kind of spelt the end for the cattle drive. Um, nevertheless, they did have a profound impact on life in the Great Plains. Uh, and these cowboys, you know, they came from all over. They were black, they were Latino, they were white, and they'd have to work together in this very hard job. And you'd have to learn how to lasso longhorns, how to ride a horse and, um, you know, get calves that went astray and deal with bad weather. So here's um, an image of some cowboys. And you can see there were, there were African-American cowboys, there were Latino, there were white. And here they are lassoing uh, oh, the longhorn. And then again, vaqueros, the, uh, they taught a lot of American cowboys how to, to do a lot of these things. That's where they got a lot of their ranching practices from. And you can see here a map showing some of the trails that led from Texas, deep in South Texas, um, up to modern places in Missouri and Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, uh, where they met up with the railroads and, um, you know, they would ship off the cattle that way. And mining was also a big deal mining was a very big deal. Um, people from all over the world had dreams of striking, a, uh, striking it rich with gold or silver. <clears throat> and it drew many Americans and non-Americans to the West. And this really began with the California gold rush in 1848-49. So over 100,000 people um, uh, headed into the California territory after gold was discovered in 1848. And the people who came out there were nicknamed the 49ers because so many of them arrived in 1849. Hence the name the San Francisco 49ers as their NFL football team. And also uh, gold and silver was discovered in places like South Dakota, Colorado, and Alaska. In all these places you saw sharp population increases after gold and silver was discovered. Um, and towns like Denver, uh, Colorado became bigger uh, cities because of the discovery of gold and silver. Hence, you get the Denver Nuggets, which is their NBA team that you have there. And uh, you would see signs like this uh, posted in cities across the country saying to come out to California and you can strike it rich and start a brand new life. Yet uh, immigrants also came from Ireland and Asia as you can see, Chinese workers on the right, um, they could be found in America trying to strike it rich and find gold. They made it uh, their way all uh, from all the way from Asia, and some came from Europe as well. Some European immigrants and European farmers came over and uh, in order to try to strike it rich and get gold. And um, meanwhile, some farmers were really struggling to get by. Uh, they were having a hard time. And, uh, you know, they had overproduction of wheat. They were growing, there was a lot of wheat that was being grown. And this, when there was an oversupply of something like wheat, uh, it led to a fall in the price. So the price of wheat decreased. 
And so they were simply making too much and they weren't making any money. They weren't able to repay their debts and banks were float foreclosing on their farms, um, confiscating their farms because they didn't pay back their debt. And the railroads were still charging high rates, even for short routes. And so for traveling short distances, they were charging high prices. And so these farmers decided to work together and fight back. So they formed organizations like the Patrons of, of Husbandry, which is also known as the Grange. And what these groups do, they provided social and educational organization for the farmers, where they could push for laws to regulate railroads and banks at the state level and at the federal level. And eventually this became known as the Farmers Alliance Alliances which educated farmers and their supporters about economic and political topics so that they could actually make a difference in local, state, and federal government. And, and so that they would know what they were talking about, right? And membership grew to more than 4 million by the 1880s. And here is a poster that helped to promote their, their cause. Notice the farmers in the middle and... Uh, People of other occupations are all around on the outside, right? So the farmer is right in the middle of this poster. And basically the farmers are making it clear that they're the ones who feed everybody. And um, that the others on the outside, the other occupations, they really couldn't do what they do, do their jobs without eating the food that the farmer uh, produce, produces. And this cartoon shows folks who tra who were trapped under the uh, the railroad tracks. So they are basically farmers trying to warn them, like, "Hey, you need me. If you don't do anything about this, we're going to get crushed by the by the railroads." And you know these issues that were affecting farmers, these challenges, and these complaints that they had. This led to something known as populism. So leaders of the farmers' alliances. Uh, decided to form a political party, and they dubbed it the Populist Party, which was actually officially known as the People's Party. And it officially formed in 1892. And they had a party convention in Omaha, Nebraska, and proposed several reforms, such as increasing the money supply, introducing a graduated income tax, which was the idea that the more money you make, the more you pay in taxes. And they wanted a federal loan program to help farmers... Uh, pay their debts. They wanted U.S. senators to be directly elected by the people. They wanted people to be able to vote in secret. They wanted single terms for the president and vice president instead of allowing the president or vice president to run for two terms or as many terms as they wanted. And they had some success. They won at the local and state level in several Western states. Uh, but many of these population uh, pop populist ideas were eventually adopted and adapted by the Democratic Party. So um, the Populist Party didn't take off quite as much, but they nevertheless, they did have a profound impact on um, American politics. So why is it that populism declined? Well, with the Panic of 1893, you had numerous railroad companies that went bankrupt. Over 15,000 businesses closed, over 500 banks closed, and this was devastating for farmers. They were dealing with hunger, they were dealing with unemployment because of uh, these banks and businesses closing. So populists and Democrats, they wanted something known as bimetallism. Now this may seem strange to us today, but what they wanted was they wanted gold and silver backed paper currency. And that means that if you go to the bank, you could literally exchange your cash and get chunks of gold and silver uh, in return. And normally that cash was supported only by gold. But if it was backed by gold and silver, then more cash could be available. And this was supported by farmers and laborers and uh, people who wanted to get their hands on more money so that they could pay off debts and buy more land and buy homes and clothes and um, and provide for their families. And they believed it would stimulate the economy and get things going. And Republicans, however, they supported the gold standard, having uh, only having gold-backed paper currency, so no silver, because this was supported by bankers and business owners. And they believed that this would stabilize the value of currency. And um, they thought if you introduce silver, then, um, then they thought uh, it would actually lose value. Currency would lose value. 
So um, currency, of all things, became the main issue of the presidential election of 1896. And uh, this was um, what everybody was talking about, basically, the issue of currency. And the leaders of the Democrats and also uh, and the uh, Populist Party endorsed a guy named William Jennings Bryan, who was an excellent speaker. He was an incredible speaker. He's very eloquent. And he could give a speech for three hours and people would stand there and listen the whole time. And one of his most famous speeches, the Cross of Gold speech, criticized Republican support of the gold standard. And he would lose to Republican R William McKinley. Um, and because of this, the Populist Party collapsed. They still were there, but they just didn't really have as much influence as they used to. But um, they are important to us today. They became an example of, you know, how people ordinary people like farmers and laborers could effectively organize and have their voices heard in government. And actually many of the rev reforms that they pushed for were eventually enacted in the 20th century. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in class. And here is a picture of William Jennings Bryant, who ran for president a couple times. He was secretary of state of the United States. So he was in the president's cabinet as well. And he was a congressman and a senator from the state of Nebraska. And here is a cartoon of him based on his cross of gold speech. And um, so thank you for watching. Um, and I hope you learned something in this lesson. Next, we'll, we're going to be learning a little bit more about um, industrialism and immigration. So just let me know if you have any questions and good luck on this assignment. Thank you.